Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm your host, Lisa Pugh. The State Senate has just wrapped up its session and we are sitting down with Senator Mary Felskowski, Republican from Irma, Wisconsin, who's worked across a wide variety of issues this session, everything from medical marijuana to dental care access to natural immunity, um, some hits and misses this session, and uh, one of your major victories, bipartisan support for funding of the closure of the Lincoln Hills Juvenile Detention Facility. It's a huge win. A huge win. So you have had some hits and misses this session. How would you grade your performance in this session this um, year? Well, I think we did really well. So I would give us a B or a B plus. Um, coming into the Senate, it's a you know it's still. It's the same job as in the assembly, but it's a different animal. You know, there's less senators. You you work a little bit differently. You're very much on your own compared to a group effort in the assembly. A lot more freedom to make decisions and how you want to proceed on things. But I, th I think we did very well. I think we did very well. We got some things across the finish line that we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, we got a couple that didn't make it across the finish line. We'll talk about those. We'll be bringing those back. But we did have some really good things for... A lot of good things for Wisconsin happened this session. Sure. So we mentioned the Lincoln Hills Juvenile Detention yeah. Center and yeah. that bipartisan support, which I mm -hmm. saw you really praising, something that you've worked on for a long time. It looked like it wasn't going to happen there for a while. Yep. What role did you play in convincing Speaker Voss to reverse his position on getting that facility in Milwaukee? So I, I will say this. You know, I did a lot of work behind the scenes on it. Um, but I want to really give a shout out to Senator Van Weingard. Van kept pushing, kept pushing. And as Robin's senator, he sat down with Robin and showed him the pros and cons of moving this forward. And then um, Van did place a call to um, former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish, who we know is running for governor, and explained to her the situation and what was happening. And as you saw in the assembly, she pushed Robin and, and said, we need to get this done, you know, because the workers are not safe. Um, it was interesting, right after we did it, I got a phone call from a supervisor there, and they're really trying to stay anonymous because they don't want um, pushback from DOC, but there was 10 staff assaults. Mm. Did you talk to Speaker Voss about that decision and asking him to support the Senate? I never no. did talk to him, no, no. Um, actually, Van, Van was the one that talked to Speaker Voss directly. Uh, we, helped keep, we helped keep it moving. Um, brought in a lot of the advocates for the closure of it, brought in the staff that works up there, why it needed to be closed, and to really get this done. Why do you think it took so long? Politics. That's all I'll say. Mm -hmm. Politics. At its worst. So moving on to another pretty political issue, uh, legalized marijuana, medical right. marijuana. You have this reputation for, you, you come back. You have a bill. It doesn't go anywhere. It comes back in a new form maybe the next session. That certainly is the case with medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. Kind of one of your misses this session. Yeah. Uh, we know that the public generally is supporting. 84%. 84% supporting medical marijuana. We just had the results in from the Marquette Law School poll where they asked not about medical marijuana this time, but um, marijuana legalization broadly. And there mm -hmm. really is increased support there. It's increased since they first asked the question in 2013. Even uh, growing support among Republicans, mm -hmm. too, for the first time. There's a majority of Republicans since 2013 supporting um, legalization of marijuana. That's up from 43% in 2013. And as you said, in 2019, when they asked the question about medical marijuana, 83% of people saying with a doctor's prescription, that's right. okay. Right. And but on the politics side, Governor Evers supports, Speaker Voss supports medical marijuana. You ran into trouble this session, Senator Lemahieu saying, um, not until the federal government. So Is that what killed the bill? Um, I, no. Um, at this time, I would say that we don't have the support for it in the Senate. Not enough votes. Right. So what we're going to do, um, I've had the conversation with um, Senate President Kappinga. He has promised us that he'll refer this bill to our committee. So even though session is over, we do not want this conversation to die. So we will have, I guess it will turn into what we would call an informational hearing because I think a lot of the resistance is the lack of knowledge. So I want to start that conversation. I want to have the committee hearings. I want to talk about how we're doing it. And Lisa, our bill is written extremely tight. Extremely tight. And Some critics would say too tight. Yes. And I 
I'm not going to say that I disagree with them. Um, but sometimes, you know, there's always that adage, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So a lot of times in politics, what we do is we pass something that's pretty, maybe might be a little bit more restrictive than we think it has to be. But then when the sky does not fall and, you know, doctors are, recomm we don't call it a prescription because it's not a drug. So it's a recommendation. When doctors are recommending this, it's not out of control. It's helping people. We realize that it it is a benefit, then we can ease up on those restrictions. So if there was a vote in the Senate on medical marijuana today, how many votes would it get? 15? 15. 15. 14, not 15. there yet. We're not there yet. You know that concept of introducing and eating an elephant one bite at a time, that's certainly something that you've learned over the course of this issue. Is that something that you didn't maybe know when you were in first Oh, when first I first elected? started? Oh, no. I was like gung-ho, you know, I want it all or none. Um, but actually, it was um, Representative John Nygren at the time. He sat me down and he's like, Mary, that's not how it works. You know, you have all these people with all these different ideas and compromises where you have to go. And so that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And once we start it, you know, and, and people become comfortable with the concept, and it's not getting into the hands of children and people that it shouldn't be getting into the hands of, then we can always expand on it. The landscape of, of legalizing marijuana, as we mentioned in the mm -hmm. poll results, really has changed. Okay. Do you agree with the Governor Evers that marijuana should be legalized and taxed at some point? You know, that's gonna be for a future legislature to decide. Um, I, I am really gonna focus on medical and I don't want to tax medical heavy. I really don't. And we're putting in a really good framework around it to keep it from being monopolized by large out-of-state corporations. Um, I, think, I think Wisconsin should start with medical. Um, and I think the citizens in the state need to get comfortable with it. Because even though 51% of Republicans, that's a whole lot of people out there that aren't comfortable with it. So if we do medical, sky does not fall, people can become more comfortable with it, we get a good regulatory framework in place, and people don't understand how important that is. So a lot of states that have full recreational marijuana, it did not pass through state law or through a legislature, it was done on a ballot initiative, something that we're not familiar with in Wisconsin because we don't allow it. So with enough resolutions, it's put on the ballot, and after a vote, like say on an April 15th, April 14th it's illegal, April 15th it's legal and it becomes chaos. And now states are trying to catch up and regulate and figure out taxation and everything. So in my opinion, personal opinion, we should legalize medical, put the framework in place, get comfortable with handling that, and then a future legislature and the citizens can decide where they wanna go. I know when you introduced this this year, you talked about your own healthcare experience mm -hmm. as a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. Is that really what brought you around on this issue? Is that why you've become such a passionate proponent for medical um, marijuana? It's part of it, but um, I have met quite a few people. Uh, we have a friend who will remain anonymous whose wife has MS horrible. And it was a late onset in life when she got it. And I mean, she went from being a vibrant, active, employed person to in a wheelchair within 18 months. Um, and the drugs have a ton of side effects and they're very, the drugs are, in order so she can function, the drugs she takes, number one, they're extremely expensive, but the side effects are not good. So she doesn't have much of her quality of life. Her husband buys marijuana illegally and gives it to, you know, and she is walking again. She's not back into the workforce, but she can walk and she can take care of the house and, and have quality of life again. And I think it's kind of my aha moment that who is the government to tell you that you can't have that choice. And we've done other things. You know, we did Marcy's Law, and we've, or, um, I can't remember, the little girl for CBD oil. Um, Joel Clayfish did that bill. And we've done other things like the right to try. You know, we did it at the state level, and then um, Senator Johnson and Senator Baldwin really pushed it at the federal level. Who's government to tell you you don't have the right to try a drug that may improve your quality of life or save you completely just because the FDA hasn't put their stamp of approval on it? 
Sounds like you're not giving up. So you get your I'm hearing. Not. not giving up. You're going to get your hearing. Yep. We're going to see this bill back. It's going to come back. It's coming back. She's As long as I'm in this legislature, it's coming back. Okay. Speaking of something that keeps coming back, the discussion of the 2020 election yep. discussed, debated. Mm -hmm. uh, when you meet with your northern Wisconsin constituents, mm -hmm. are they concerned about the way they cast their ballots, the way their votes are counted? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have pockets that are, um, their, it's their number one concern and it's their number one passion. Um, but yes, people are very, very concerned. And we know, we know that things were done that um, were done illegally. And, you know, we've passed a lot of legislation. Um, a lot of it's on the LAB audit, the will audit, um, how to tighten those up and close those loopholes. And we will see if it gets vetoed or not. But it is a large concern. So do those voters tell you that they think that President Trump won the 2020 election or have they accepted that Mr. Biden is president? It's split. It's very split. Um, it depends on who you're talking to. You know, we've provided tons of data for them. Um, they, they're just, they're really struggling uh, with the special voting deputies and how it was handled in nursing homes and the fraud that was found. They're really struggling with the Zuckerberg Brooks in Green Bay and how that was handled when you had the clerk step down. Um, ballot harvesting, uh, Supreme Court rules that ballots in Dane County should be held separate and they don't follow the Supreme Court's ruling. And it's like the Wild West. Nobody is being held accountable for anything that was done. and. They're struggling with that. Like, why? Why are we not holding people accountable? Do you believe President Trump lost, and if so, why? Um, you know, I, at first I struggled with it, with all the election issues that went on. But when you look at the numbers, um, Assembly Republicans got 59,000 more votes than President Trump. It's pretty decisive. You know, you look at the congressional districts. If if somebody was going to steal the election, wouldn't they have stole it down ballot? That's your evidence. So that... I wish I was a hundred... There's a little corner of doubt for, I think, all of us because of election integrity. Um, and I find that very sad. We should never doubt our elections. And we need to do something to make sure that nobody does. Was the Justice Gableman investigation helpful or a fishing expedition, like Democrats would say? You know, the LAB report was a very good report. And a lot of what Justice Gableman's report um, had a lot of the same things in it. Um, I think that Just Justice Gableman named names and pinpointed things more than the LAB audit was broad. Um, evidence, the more we know is never a bad thing. So did you learn some things in the Gableman report? Um, I learned more in-depth things. I think it was things that we already knew from the LAB report, but I think he broke it down farther. What is the top election reform that needs to be in place before the presidential election in 2024? Hmm. A lot. Number one, we need, you know, we need clarification on drop boxes, which is happening. Um, I think we need better chain of command of the ballots. And the laws that we have need to be followed. And if they're not followed, people need to be held accountable. There's no accountability, and I think that's very, very sad. The denial of the election, of the 2020 election, has been part of the gubernatorial race. Uh, Representative Rantham, who's running for governor, has made it an election issue, causing kind of further divide in your party in those primary candidates. Mm -hmm. Do you wish that he would not be running for governor? I will never say that, because I think anybody, I think that would be, me going against what I truly believe. Um, I think anybody that wants to run for an office should run for an office. Um, but I, I, think, I think Tim is a little far out there. I think he's taken this to a level um, without the proof, and I think that's sad. Have you endorsed anyone in no. the GOP? Will you? No. That's not your... I, I should re I've endorsed Adam Jarko for Attorney General. But as far as the gubernatorial and other races, I have not. Talking a little bit more about issues in your district, mm -hmm. a federal judge yeah. recently blocked the annual wolf hunt. Should there be an annual wolf hunt? That's an important issue. Absolutely. 
Why is that? I, I think, you know, we've allowed the wolf hunt to become a passionate issue instead of a science-based issue. We regulate predators in this state. We re regulate um, bobcats, um, bears, so that we keep the numbers to an acceptable level that our ecosystem can handle. Why do we think we don't need to do that with wolves? So your reaction to the federal judge's order? You know, and it's become political. You know, you have your groups on the left and your humane societies and all that. Um, I find it very interesting when a judge in California, who's probably never set foot in northern Wisconsin, has no idea of our wildlife management, makes that decision. And I find it very sad that we have to adhere to that. Switching gears now to a different issue, you've been very vocal, even since you were first elected, about health care access yes. in your district and across northern Wisconsin, specifically oral health care. I was looking yes. back at some of your early interviews. You've been talking about this for a long time. Yes. This is another issue where you've introduced bills. Some have moved, some mm -hmm. not. Just yesterday, you had a little victory we in did. the Senate. You've been pushing for kind of expanding the practice of dental health professionals and this thing called dental auxiliaries. Tell us what passed um, the Senate so is now on the governor's desk. It's an expanded function dental assistant. Uh, we have them in other states, but they've really, where this came to us is from the military. Um, and the dental assistant that is standing next to your dentist and handing him tools and doing different procedures, we gave them more authority. So, and that was requested by the Wisconsin Dental Association. They said this is nonsensical, that they can't do this. It would allow the dentist to do some of the more um, in-depth procedures. And it was interesting what they can and cannot do when we really looked at it. So it does include some education through the technical colleges and then on-the-job training and different things. So we expanded the scope of what a dental assistant can do. What does dental care access look like in northern Wisconsin currently? Uh, sometimes I want to say non-existent. Wisconsin has 72 counties, of which 64 are uh, dental shortage areas com uh, as determined by CMS at the federal level. And if you, especially for low-income people, I mean, if you are a self-pay person, you have dental insurance, you're fine. If you are low-income, you might have to travel. I know a family in Monaco that travels to Eau Claire in order to see a dentist that will accept Medicaid. Or you must, you know, you're on an FQHC waiting list or some of the free charitable clinics and stuff. So it's very hard. Um, it's very hard. And it's not just rural in northern Wisconsin. It's very much urban Wisconsin also. So you've made a little progress yes, with this dental auxiliary bill. Do you expect the governor to sign it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Has he's, bipartisan support? Yeah, he's always been good on dental health care access. In fact, um, my other bill, which is dental therapists, we passed it to the Senate unanimously. Um, Robin Voss stopped it in the Assembly. It's still sitting in the Assembly Committee on Org. Um, governor Evers had called me in early in the session and said, how can I help you get that done? Why? So you have talked about these dental bills as part of a multi-pronged approach. So yes. it's not kind of a one no. and done uh -uh. in terms of fixing the problem. Why, why do we go back and do dental therapy? How does that help expand access? So it's kind of like if you think about the medical field, I think one thing we're all very familiar with is um, PAs, physician's assistants, or a nurse practitioner. It's kind of a mid-level provider, and that's what a dental therapist is. They must work under the scope of a dentist, so they have to have a dentist that would employ them or like supervise them. But they do, it's easiest to explain as a dentist does over 400 procedures. A dental therapist is, li is limited to about 95. But of those 95 procedures, they are the most common procedures. Um, think filling and drilling and examining. So they do the more, um, less intrusive. And by doing that, that frees up that dentist to do some of the more complex issues. And then the dentist is there in case, you know, as a dental therapist is working on your mouth, if something comes up that is outside their scope, the dentist is always around there to help, you know, step in. Just like with a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner, they always have doctors. So why do you think you've had such trouble moving that bill? Why is Speaker Voss holding that? So up? at first, the Wisconsin Dental Association, when we first introduced it, they were opposed to it. And to their credit, um, they came to us this year and they said, we know you're going to bring it back. Let's sit down and work on it together and get to a place where we can all support it. And they did that. They were great partners. Um, and the dental hygienists, great partners. We worked on it. Um, 
we got it to the place where the dentist, they didn't thumbs up us, but they were neutral on it. Then they came and they testified, you know, that, and they said some of their members would like it, some are still cautious on it. Um, so it passed unanimous in the Senate, and that's a question for Speaker Voss. He just basically blocked it. He did not allow it to have a hearing or nothing. So I can't imagine why you would do something that would actually hurt the constituency of the state of Wisconsin, but he chose to do so. Is this one of those issues that you're going to come back with again? Absolutely. SB 1 or 2. So this must be a really prominent issue that you also go out and hear about in your district. We do. You know, and, and even if we passed dental therapy this year, at least, it's still going to be, you know, the tech colleges got to get up and going and get the programs in place. You know, we could bring um, dental therapists in from other states if they were trained. Um, Minnesota has a great program. They've actually expanded it now to two other, or another college, and it's been very successful over there. Um, but it's still, it's going to take a lot of time. The third thing we did around dental is we increased the Medicaid reimbursement by 40% this year because we were on the low side. But it's not, a, none of these are magic bullets. It's going to take time and to build up to actually get this access to people. One of the things we've always heard about is the opioid crisis. And you think this about it. This is connected. If I, low income, I don't have access you know, to dental insurance or maybe I just can't afford it, if I have an infected tooth or a toothache, I go to the emergency room, what do they do for me? Maybe give me an antibiotic and something to deal with the pain. But then, if that becomes chronic, do I turn to opioids or something to help kill that pain? It's also a workforce issue. If you are in pain and you have dental pain, it's very hard to concentrate, to go to work, to be productive. But think of it in a broader scope. Think of it from a pediatric standpoint. Um, we were at Children's Hospital and doing a tour, and um, there was a young girl there. She was eight years old. She weighed 32 pounds. She had 11 cavities in her mouth. How do I eat? How do I grow? How do I develop? How do I go to school and concentrate when you're, you have those issues? So this is a very big issue. Another issue that you've been really vocal about, very passionate about, is related to COVID policy yes. over these last two years. A very vocal about mask mandates, vaccine mandates. I know this session you had introduced a bill um, promoting natural immunity in lieu mm -hmm. of vaccination. Uh, how will we, do you think we'll look back at this time in our history? I around? think it'll be a huge learning curve. Um, you know, everything we do, COVID came at us out of the blue, and we react. And when you react, sometimes I think we overreacted. Um, and it, it, people's natural, people's personal freedoms should not be infringed on. And um, I just really believe in people having the choice whether or not to put that vaccine in their body. And I don't think anybody should be mandated to do that. You took some heat on that natural immunity bill and mm -hmm. some criticism. Clearly the pandemic kind of became a partisan issue. Some would say that legislation like that, that you know the governor's gonna veto makes it even more partisan. How do you respond? Um, I don't think that they're wrong on that, but, and this but can be a very, very large word. Not having the conversation about natural immunity and not having the conversation about giving people the choices that I think that we all should inherently have is wrong. And there's people out there that lost their jobs because of a medical choice. I mean, these people a year ago were heroes, and we had them on a pedestal in the healthcare industry. Today, they're out the door because they refuse to put an experimental drug that has no, if you are, if you are injured by this drug, you have no recourse because we gave, them, we gave them immunity at the federal level. And over the summer, I met a lot of people that were injured by that drug. I met a gentleman who spent 98 days in the hospital, 64 in ICU, as a result of the Johnson drug, according to him. You'd introduce that bill all over again. Absolutely, because I firmly 100% believe in it. So you know this record high gas prices, increasing inflation, impacting Wisconsinites, I'm sure, in your district. Um, the Senate this week 
gaveled in and out of the governor's special session where he had proposed tax refund to Wisconsinites. With our the record projected surplus, mm -hmm. why is now not the time to provide a tax refund to Wisconsinites? So because of what you just said, record high inflation and energy costs. What are what are what is our future going to look like? What's the next budget going to look like? And a lot of the money that came in, um, I call it artificial money, and I think we need to be very careful what we do. Um, I think I'm very cautious. What is what is our transportation costs for our schools going to be if gas hits five to seven dollars a gallon? And if we don't do, if the federal government and Biden doesn't do something about it in my opinion, lift the EPA rule and let them refine and let them let us become energy independent again, as we were under the previous administration. Where's that money going to come from? So I think, just like right now, I think a lot of households are hanging on to their savings, looking forward to what could be and what our costs are going to be down the road. I think now we need to do that at the government level too. So wait until the next biennial budget to think about a tax refund for Wisconsinites. Or we might not be able to do a refund. We might need to transportation issues. You know, what are the costs? What, are the, what is our Medicaid budget going to look like? What is our um, food stamps budget going to look like? People are hurting. So looking forward to, we talked a little bit before the interview about what's next. You mentioned uh, that you want to continue working on medical yes. marijuana, that we can expect a reintroduction of that dental therapy bill. What are you going to be doing in the next few months? Tell us your other priorities. So I'm not up for election this year, so it's kind of one would think that's a free summer off. Well, I'll be helping a lot of my colleagues, but I, we do what's called ledge council studies um, when it's a campaign year. And we've submitted a couple of them. I said, I don't know if they'll be chosen. That's up to the, the Ledge committee. Ledge Council study committees are when legislators and community members get together. Right. And, and experts. And the one that we've um, submitted is how do we help somebody who's completed their incarceration, um, how do we help them get back into the workforce? What are the steps that we as a state should be doing to help them become productive viable, happy members of society again and to pr lower recidivism. So that's one of the studies that we're doing because um, we know we have a worker shortage and the key things are helping people find employment, find a place to live, and then like a support network. And that can look like very many, that could be family, that could be your church, that could be friends, or it could be a community center. Something so that they have a support network so they don't fall back into old ways and, and violate again. Another one is around long-term funding of EMS. You know, we did some things in this budget. We just passed the EMS bill for um, funding of EMS, but I think we're going to have to have a long-term discussion because it is becoming more expensive, and a lot of our rural communities, just townships, they're, they're struggling. So both those issues, the emergency services and kind of that recidivism issue and getting people into the workforce, those are important in northern Wisconsin? I think they are. They're important statewide. Um, we need a workforce, and we have people that need to find a career and become happy again, quality of life. Um, people make mistakes. We need to give them the opportunity to get back into the workforce, and, you know, God forgives, we need to also. So you are not slowing down. No. 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 We're going to have a lot of things ready for next, next session. It's been really nice talking to you today. Thank you for sharing your priorities and your perspective on the Senate Chess session. Well, thank you for having us. Okay. And thank you to our viewers of Newsmakers. Be sure to tune in again as we highlight the issues and sit down with the decision makers who make a difference for all of us. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.